You are attending the Soul Cafe, which is our weekly event in Orange County community. It's open to the general public as well as to the Baha'is. And this week we have Karen Ford, who's a practicing chiropractic physician in St. Petersburg for many, many years, I think four decades. Uh, we're all anxious to hear your topic. It's on attaining the divine presence. Well, good morning, everyone. Stand up. Stand up first. Now put your hands together. That's right. Now, just in case I don't get a standing ovation later, I wanted to experience it now. Everybody sit down. It says in the Bible writings, if thou desirest to deliver a discourse, it will prove more effectual after musical melody. You know, one of the ways to attain the divine presence is obviously through prayer. Because it's in that rarefied state that we're receptive, hopefully, to the Holy Spirit. There is a song that comes from the writings of Baha'u'llah that says, Prayer is a ladder by which everyone may ascend unto heaven. So it starts out with prayer, said four times, and then it says prayer is a ladder by which everyone may ascend to heaven. Everybody say that. Prayer is a ladder by which everyone may ascend to heaven. Okay. So it goes, prayer, 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 prayer. Those of you who sing a harmony, please feel free. Here we go. Prayer, prayer, prayer. be on my second of three pilgrimages in 1986 to the holy places, the Baha'i holy places in Israel, in Haifa and the surrounding areas. And as Baha'is who travel to take pilgrimage to these Baha'i holy places who are taken to various buildings and sites where the history of the faith comes to life and your connection to that history becomes more real. One of those places is the shrine of Baha'u'llah, where the last remains of the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith are interred. And one day I had traveled to the shrine of Baha'u'llah. For those of you who have been, I bowed my head at the threshold of the room in which Baha'u'llah's body was interred. And I prayed to learn how to pray. 
I realize that in the writings of our faith, it says, intone, O my servants, the verses of God that have been received by thee, as intoned by them who had drawn nigh unto him. I thought about that passage, and I said, as intoned by them who have drawn nigh unto him. How do they intone those passages? Though then, who are the ones that have drawn nigh unto him? That the sweetness of thy melody may kindle thine own soul and attract the hearts of men. Whoso resideth in the privacy of his chamber, the verses revealed by God. The scattering angels of the Almighty will scatter abroad the fragrances until every, and I'm paraphrasing now, until every heart is moved. And it even has a transforming effect on one's own being. I pray, I read those creative words, but I knew there was something more some condition or state that I could achieve where closeness to God would be a reality at all times and under all conditions. Three years later, I'm in my Baha'i community in St. Petersburg, Florida, and a dear Baha'i teacher, Rayson Dobbs, talked about this subject attaining the divine presence. And essentially, he said that it's promised all people that this has nothing to do with salvation, which requires some action on our part over the long term. So salvation and attaining the presence are two entirely different subjects. Some people think that attaining the presence of God is easy, just walk in front of a bus, right? You know, attain the presence of God. But the reality is, is that the writings of our faith and the writings of other faiths intimate that the attainment of the presence of God is potentially yours at any moment in time, swifter than the twinkling of an eye, if you but wish it, if you make the will a door through which the Holy Spirit may come. There is a passage in the hidden words, and the hidden words were written by Baha'u'llah encapsulating all of the truths, the spiritual truths of old in a poetic prose. And he said, O son of love, thou art but one step away from the glorious heights above in the celestial tree of love. Take thou but one pace, and with the next enter the pavilion of eternity. Well, the question that begs to be answered is what is that one step? What must occur in order for us to enter the pavilion of eternity? In the middle 1990s, I became introduced to the science of heart-focused activity. So I had had this revelation about prayer and its relationship to changing your state or condition. And in the Baha'i writings and in spiritual teachings from every dispensation, there has been reference to the human heart as the throne upon which God sits. We've all thought of it as a metaphor. Well, in the middle 1990s, I traveled to California and was introduced to the Institute of Heart Math. At the Institute of Heart Math, they were studying the impact of positive emotion on not only the heart, where it was self-ingested into the area around the heart, but all oscillating systems of the body. So with the ingestion for five minutes of deeply held, deeply felt appreciation and gratitude, oscillating systems, that means systems with with uh, cycles, the immune system, the cardiovascular system, the endocrine system, were all favorably affected by the self-ingestion of positive emotion into the area around the heart. Now we all know that spirit, if you define spirit, what is it? In other words, not a oh, sentence, but in other words, is spirit not love? Is it enthusiasm? Is it positive emotion? In other words, is it contentment? Is that spirit? Is worry spirit? Is overwhelm spirit? Is depression spirit? All spirit is all good. In the writings of Abdul Baha, he says, if a man has 10 bad qualities and one good one, I'm so happy about this, 10 bad qualities and one good one, forget the bad. Why would he say that? Because spirit works through good. 
And so if we focus on the good, the possibility of transformation is present in the moment. If we focus on the bad, there is no possibility that the Holy Spirit can flow through us or to that other being for transformation to occur. And so since we can't change someone else, we can only hopefully progress and grow and change ourselves. If we become channels for the Spirit, then we recognize good and support good and encourage good in others and forget about all else. Knowing these principles, I sat down with the research director at the Institute of Heart Math at lunch. And he started talking about all the referee journals, you know, the medical journals that all the research was published in, and Motorola and Intel and National Semiconductor and Shell and all four branches of the military were using these techniques to ameliorate stress. And he talked about the physiologic changes that were measurable in the laboratory that occurred under these circumstances, the enhancement of immune system function, the lowering of the stress hormone cortisol, the raising of what's sometimes called a sex hormone, DHEA, an anti-aging hormone, the amelioration of the feeling of stress that can be measured on a scale of zero to 10. Well, if you think about this particular subject, this particular stressor, how does it feel to you? Well, it's an eight, you know, it's a 10, it's six, you know, it's not so bad, it's a three. Okay, so zero to 10, 10 being the worst. I was talking to him about these subjects and I said, you know, I've been studying Holy Scripture in relationship to the possibility of attaining the presence of God. And there are metaphorically statements in that literature about the human heart. And what they found is the self-ingestion of positive emotion into the heart creates a state called coherence. Coherence is the harmony of heart rhythms that oscillates and communicates throughout the human system, creating favorable effects physiologically. And I said, I've been studying this topic and it seems like the heart in spiritual literature might be more than a metaphor. And he said, what we know is the human heart is where matter and spirit meet. But we can't publish that in the referee journal. We have to look at the science. I said, oh, very interesting. So what we're going to do is I'm going to do a little experiment before I get into the depth of this subject, I want you to measure three things. One is I want you all to measure on a scale of zero to 10 any stressor in your life. So close your eyes and think about that stressful thought or circumstance and measure it on a scale of zero to 10, how it feels inside of you when you think about that stressful circumstance. I'll give you 15 seconds to do that. Very good. Just remember that number, whatever you assign to it, any place from zero to 10. Everybody have that? Raise your hand and say aye. 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 Thank you. I love it when you follow directions. Instant, exact, and complete obedience. <laughs> Second, I want you to measure a pain. So everybody stand up. And get someplace, if you have a pain in your shoulder, move your shoulder around. If you have a pain in your back, you know, bend over at the waist. Don't worry about people around you. Everybody bend over, just so to keep some people feel comfortable about bending over. If you have pain in your elbow and you can touch it and feel it, you know, push that elbow or pain in your neck. Any place you have pain. If you don't have pain, you can't do this part of the, the, the issue, obviously. Or we could create some pain. <laughs> I'm very good at that and I will volunteer. It really brings me joy. And you measured that on a scale of zero to 10. Now the next thing I want you to do is measure a range of motion that is limited. So if you don't have a particular joint that is dysfunctional, like if I had a shoulder, I might measure this, or I might measure if I could raise my arm above my head sideways and it was the same as the other side. If you don't have anything, just bend over at the waist and try to touch your toes. Go ahead. If you don't have and touch your toes. Even if you don't have pain, it doesn't make any difference. Go as far as you can and then come back up and go down again to make sure you know how far you can go and mark it. So mark it on your legs so you can see where it is. 
mark it at the floor, mark how many knuckles you can put on the floor, whatever the case might be. Everybody had that? Okay, sit down. Now we've measured three things. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take you through a guided imagery. And I'm going to ask you to remember something that you truly appreciate and are grateful for in your life right now. Anything or anyone, any circumstance that you're truly grateful for and appreciate in your life right now. Everybody have something? Raise your hand and say aye. Okay. And then we're going to, after we get done with this, we're going to measure those three parameters again. Are you ready? You're going to have to remember your stressful thought because at one particular point, I will ask you to recall that stressful thought and throw it into your heart. The heart, we're going to imagine that it's a bowl and we're going to fill it up with feelings of appreciation and gratitude. So everyone close their eyes. I want you to begin to take deep and rhythmic breaths, about five seconds in, five seconds out as if you're breathing through the area around your heart. With your gentle focus being on the heart, which is center of the chest and slightly left. And with every deep and rhythmic breath, you recall those feelings of appreciation and gratitude, and you fill your heart as if it's a bowl. So with every deep and rhythmic breath. Feelings of appreciation and gratitude fill up your heart until that bowl overflows into your chest. Feelings of appreciation and gratitude for something, someone, fill up your heart and overflows into your entire chest cavity. Is filled with feelings of appreciation and gratitude flowing out of the heart. Feelings of appreciation and gratitude, your gentle focus always on the heart. If you shift away, just gently go back. Filling up the heart with these feelings of appreciation and gratitude with every deep and rhythmic breath. They overflow into your entire chest and abdomen until your chest and abdomen are filled with feelings of appreciation and gratitude. Continuing to breathe deeply and rhythmically, filling up your heart with feelings of appreciation and gratitude. They overflow into your chest and abdomen and pelvis and legs and feet until your entire chest, abdomen, pelvis, legs and feet are filled <coughs> with feelings of appreciation and gratitude. With every deep and rhythmic breath, feelings of appreciation and gratitude fill up your heart and overflow into your chest and abdomen, pelvis, legs, and feet, arms and hands, neck and head, until your entire body is filled with feelings of appreciation and gratitude. At this particular time, you remember that stressful thought, and you throw it into your heart, and you watch it float away on appreciation and gratitude. It disappears. Forgetting all else with your gentle focus on the heart, you continue to fill the heart with feelings of appreciation and gratitude with every deep and rhythmic breath. Once again, you remember that stressful thought. You throw it into your heart and you watch it float away on appreciation and gratitude. And it disappears. Forgetting all else, your gentle focus back to your heart you continue filling your heart with feelings of appreciation and gratitude with every deep and rhythmic breath, breathing in for five seconds and out as if you're breathing through your heart. One last time, that stressful thought comes into your mind and you throw it into your heart and it floats away on a torrent of appreciation and gratitude and it disappears. Forgetting all else, your gentle focus on the heart, you continue to fill the heart with feelings of appreciation and gratitude. And it overflows into every part of your body. With three more breaths, filling your heart each time with feelings of appreciation and gratitude, you will open your eyes. 
How many felt a difference from the first time they threw that stressful thought into their heart to the third? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So I want you to measure. I want you to think about that stressful thought, those of you who thought about it before, and I want you to take 15 seconds and compare it to the first time you did it just about five minutes ago. And measure it on a scale of 0 to 10. How many people had a reduction in the emotional content of that particular feeling? Okay. So a little more than half the room. Not bad. Feel the area of pain. Stand up. Feel the area of pain, wherever that pain was, and see if it's changed or not. It might or it might not. It's not 100%, but see if it has or it hasn't. How many people found a reduction in pain in the area that they measured previously? So there's uh, maybe one third of the room. Not bad. Now measure your range of motion. Bending over. Measure where it is. How many people have increased range of motion? OK, the reason for that, everybody sit down. The reason for that is because when you release any kind of trauma, you release the, the tension or the tone in the musculature, and so range of motion often increases. So this is something that all of you can do because I think all of you have hearts in the room. Is that true? You can do it on a daily basis, and it's probably the most powerful single self-help procedure that you could ever perform, taking you to a place where you're just ingesting spirit. Gratitude appreciation is what they did the research on. Isn't that interesting that these physiologic and emotional parameters change? So I looked at this work, and I looked at the writings of Baha'u'llah in relationship to attaining the divine presence, and this is what I found. The purpose of God in creating man, and you can read along if you like, will ever be to enable him to attain his presence. Everything has to do with purpose. Every decision in your life, it's, if it's centered around purpose, has a different outcome than if it's centered around a non-purposeful existence. So what is the purpose of my life? Well, the purpose of God in creating man will ever be to enable him to attain his presence. So in one sense, we could evaluate everything. Is this going to help me attain his presence or not? The grace of attaining unto the presence of God has been promised unto all people. Now what does that mean, grace? What does it mean? It means we don't have to do anything. In fact, what we've done in the past or what we do in the future has nothing to do with attaining the presence of God because it's only by grace that we attain his presence. And he said, so he's bestowed upon men the grace of attaining unto the presence of God and it's been promised unto all people. So this fathomless and surging ocean is near, astonishingly near. It is closer than your life vain. Swift as the twinkling of an eye, if ye but wish it. So you have to make an effort. You have to wish it. Reach and partake of this imperishable flavor. Thou art but one step away from the glorious heights above in the celestial tree of love. Take thou one pace and with the next, advance into the immortal realm and enter the pavilion of eternity. What is that one step? creating a state or condition in which the Holy Spirit can have influence on you. It has nothing to do with what you've done or what you might do. It's promised unto all people. It's grace, not worthiness. So if you have a problem with worthiness, Baha'u'llah has a solution for that one too. We'll talk about that in a minute. Lift up the veil that obscureth your vision. Everybody go like this. Lift up the veil that obscureth your vision, that ye may behold that which no eye hath beheld, and hear that which no ear hath heard. So we have to wish it. We have to take one step. That's it. Everybody stand up. We have to do what? Wish it. And wish it. We have to wish it. And then we need to, everybody, take one step. That's it. 
and we got a twinkle. Everybody twinkle. That's right. We're about ready to attain the presence as we speak. Everybody sit down. Hallelujah. Can I get an amen from the church? Amen. Okay, good. So, so what are the means of attainment? Well, Baha'u'llah tells us that too. Arise, and with the whole enthusiasm of your hearts. Woo, enthusiasm. All the eagerness of your soul. Eagerness. Okay. The full fervor of your will. Fervor. Woo. Yes. I'm going to do it once. Okay. Full fervor of your will and the concentrated effort of your entire being. That means you need your spiritual resources and your physical resources in order to accomplish this task. And it says... Strive to attain the paradise of his presence and endeavor to inhale the fragrance of the incorruptible flower, to breathe the sweet savors of holiness, and to obtain a portion of this perfume of celestial glory. But here's the important point. Whoso followeth this counsel. What is the counsel? Enthusiasm of what? Your heart. All the eagerness of your soul. soul, the full fervor of your will, the concentrated effort of your entire being. being. Whoso follows this counsel does those things, will, not could, not might, but he says will break his chains asunder. Taste the abandonment of enraptured love will attain unto his heart's desire, will surrender his soul into the hands of his beloved, bursting through his cage, he will wing his flight to the, his holy and everlasting nest. Baha'u'llah unequivocally says, by grace, if ye but wish it, if you take that one step which requires you to have enthusiasm of your heart, all the eagerness of your soul, the concentrated effort of your entire being, being and of course the full fervor of your yeah. will. So it says it requires will. You must wish it. You must take the step. There must be a change that occurs. You can't keep standing emotionally, spiritually where you are right now. You have to move to some other state or condition. Have you ever heard this statement, uh, you can't put your foot in the same river twice? Yes. Because the river is constantly flowing. So even though we call it by one name, it's changing constantly. So we have to change in order to achieve a state or condition where we can be influenced by the Holy Spirit. So let's talk about this heart, because the first thing that he says we must have enthusiasm of the heart, right? Thy heart is my home, Baha'u'llah says. Sanctify it for my descent. Thank you, church. I appreciate that. Just read along with me. <laughs> Old Sandy was back in the 1960s. Just All right. talking to the preacher. <laughs> Thy heart is my home, sanctified for my descent. Thy spirit is my place of revelation. Cleanse it for my manifestation. So if I was just reading that, I would say, how do I sanctify my heart for thy descent? Or how do I cleanse it for his manifestation? Those are the questions. It's not just reading and saying, oh, yes, this is so wonderful. It's saying, well, how, how do I do that? What do I have to do? What kind of changes need to occur in order for this to happen? Whensoever the light of the manifestation of the king of oneness settleth upon the throne of the heart and soul, his shining become visible in every limb and member. At that time, the mystery of the famed tradition gleameth out of the darkness. A servant is drawn unto me in prayer, until I answer him. And when I have answered, I become the ear wherewith he heareth. For thus the master of the house hath appeared within his home, and all the pillars of that dwelling are ashine with his light. God descends upon the throne of the human heart in that rarefied state that you can achieve if you but wish it. If you take one step, if with the whole enthusiasm of your heart, all the eagerness of your soul, the full fervor of your will, the concentrated effort of your entire being, you strive to attain the paradise of his presence because he promises us that whoso followeth this counsel will break his chains asunder, will taste the abandonment of enraptured love. And why? Because it, we're worthy of it? No, because it's God's grace unto all mankind. It's God's grace that we can attain his presence. 
So we don't have to step in front of a bus. That's not the step we have to take to attain his presence. We have to do something else in this plane of existence to allow that to happen so that we can be influenced by the Holy Spirit. Earth and heaven cannot contain me. What can alone contain me is the heart of him that believeth in me and is faithful to my cause. So how do we cleanse our heart? Remember we asked that question? Cleanse your heart? With the burnish of the spirit, it says. And hasten to the court of the Most High. So what spirit? We talked about it earlier. It's all good. It's all those emotions that draw into us joy and enthusiasm and fervor and gratitude and appreciation. All of those things. So as we feel those things, which is what the Institute of Heart Math was telling people to feel in order to have these physiological changes and ameliorate some of the emotional content of stressful circumstances in your life, emotionally stressful circumstances, we say cleanse thy heart with the burnish of the spirit. Is that a metaphor or is that a physical reality? So how do we deal with worthiness? <coughs> because sometimes we feel unworthy to be in the presence of God. But he says, has nothing to do with worthiness because he says rejoice in the gladness of thine heart that thou mayest be worthy to meet me. So what has to happen in order for me to be worthy? I'm over here and I'm making some rather significant errors in my life and my decision making. Nobody else in this room has ever done that, I know. But occasionally, this happens to me. So I'm going to use myself as an example. I'm making these errors in judgment. I know I've made an error in judgment. And I'm not following a path that's going to lead me anywhere except to some disaster someplace. I don't feel worthy in that moment of the presence of God in my life because I have seemingly cut myself off. But because of grace, if I but wish it, then I take that one step and rejoice in the gladness of my heart, I immediately become worthy. That's it. I may not be worthy over here, but I am worthy when I take that step. So worthiness is dealt with in an instant, in a moment, by rejoicing in the gladness of one's heart. So worthiness is no longer an excuse. Then he says, intention brings attainment. This is from Abdul Baha. So we must intend to attain in order to attain. That's it. Intention brings attainment. Whenever thou shalt long for me, thou shalt find me close to thee. Longing, that's the other key word. Longing, wishing, not hoping. I hope he comes today. No, we have to stand up. We have to rejoice in the gladness of our heart. We have to have all the enthusiasm of our heart, the full fervor of our will, the concentrated effort of our entire being. I skipped one, what was it? No, I thought it was something about soul. It, it, there is, there is, all the eagerness of your soul. I skipped it just so you could say it. Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> Let's give an amen for Sandy. <laughs> amen. <laughs> okay. In the delight of hearts, the Persian poet says, Make no search for water, but find thirst, and water from the very ground will burst. What is thirst in relationship to water? The need, the desire. The desire. So we have to have the desire. If we find the desire within us, the Holy Spirit will pour upon us from the heavens. How do we find that desire? We must wish for it. We must have intention. We must take one step. And what is that step? With all the enthusiasm of our heart, with all the eagerness of our soul, the full fervor of our will, the concentrated effort of our entire being, strive to attain the paradise of his presence. Remember when we were talking about entire being, we said we have to use our physical powers and our spiritual powers. So what are our spiritual powers? Well, our spiritual powers are imagination, thought, comprehension, and memory as well as the common faculty. And what does the common faculty do? It's the intermediary between our physical powers, the five senses, and our spiritual powers. Thought, imagination, memory. What's the other one? Comprehension, right? If those are the spiritual powers and the outer powers are, are the physical powers and we want to use our whole being, might we raise our hands to the heavens? 
Might we bow our head to the floor? Why do you think Baha'u'llah has us do that in obligatory prayers? These prayers require certain actions physically. Now these actions in and of themselves mean nothing, right? They mean nothing, or they could mean many things. But in that state that he is trying to help you get into to say that prayer, he's asking you to do these particular activities to engage your senses, your physical being, along with your spiritual powers to achieve a state that is appropriate for receiving the Holy Spirit. So focus is necessary when focus or thinking is concentrated on a single point. Wonderful will be the fruits thereof. This applies to everything in your life. If you want to accomplish something, you focus it like a laser to the desired goal. No matter what it is, if it's in business, in your personal life, with your children, whatever it might be, in attaining the divine presence, it requires the same thing. What I want you to do is I want you to go back to that place with all the enthusiasm of your heart, all the eagerness of your soul. And I just want you to get into that place that you got in with heart math, of appreciation and gratitude, with rejoicing. And I want to see it on your faces. Okay, everybody act depressed. Go ahead. Act depressed right now. Act depressed. Look around the room. What's everybody doing? How did you learn to do this? You all have been practicing. Everybody knows you look down, your face, you know, looks down, you get you slump your shoulders. Look enthusiastic. Everybody. Quickly. Enthusiasm. Rejoicing. What do you have to do? Smile. You lift your you smile, you lift yourself up. So this is what I want you to do. These are physiologic changes that actually affect state. In fact, it is said that the most powerful way to change state is to change your physiology. What do we say to children who are bored? I'm bored, mama. Go outside and play. Get up and do something, right? Go outside and play. We want them to move because we know that motion begets emotion, and it will change their state or condition. These are the principles distilled down to their very fundamental core that we have to do as well. So I want you to sit as if you're enthusiastic, as if you're waiting the presence of God. I want you to sit as if God, in human form, as Jesus or Moses or Baha'u'llah or Abu Baha is going to enter the room right now and look straight at you with love and embrace you. So I want you to sit as if that is going to happen. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to take these deep and rhythmic breaths, feeling these feelings of appreciation and gratitude, wishing for and longing for the presence of God with enthusiasm, rejoicing in your heart. The full fervor of your will. Breathe deeply. Wish it, long for Rejoice. And sing along with me. Is there any way more difficulties? Say God. Say praise. Is 
My friends that dwell upon the dust, haste forth unto your celestial habitation. O lovers of his beauty, turn the anguish of your separation from him into the joy of an everlasting reunion, and let the sweetness of his presence dissolve the bitterness of your remoteness from his court. For whereas in days past every lover besought and searched after his beloved, it is the beloved himself who now is calling his lovers and is inviting them to attain his presence. O ye that thirst after him, strip yourselves of every earthly affection and hasten to embrace your beloved with a zest that none can equal. Make haste to attain unto him. The flower thus far hidden from the sight of men is unveiled to your eyes. In the open radiance of his glory, he standeth before you. His voice summoneth all the holy and sanctified beings to come and be united with him. Attaining the divine presence is a choice. One must intend it. One must wish for it. One must long for it. One must rejoice to handle any issues of worthiness. One must understand that grace, it's by grace, not by what we've done in the past or what we will do in the future, that this promise is made unto all people. Whoso followeth this counsel will break his chains asunder and taste the abandonment of enraptured love. It's a choice. At any time, at any moment. We must practice it. We must learn to achieve that state more quickly than we have possibly in the past. Some remember a time when they felt close and go back to that time using their imagination and memory and smell the smells that they smelled in the garden when they felt close to God or see with their inner eye what their sight, their outer vision saw at that moment that they felt close. For everybody, it's the same principles, but a slightly different experience to get to that particular state or condition. Make no search for water. Find thirst. And water from the very ground will burst. It's me, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer, it's a me, it's a me, it's a me, oh Lord. I'm standing in the need of prayer. It's not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord. I'm standing in the need of prayer. It's not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord. I'm standing in the need of prayer. It's a me, it's a me, it's a me, oh Lord. I'm standing in the need of prayer. Everybody stand up. It's a me, it's a me, it's a me, oh Lord. I'm standing in the need of prayer. It's not my mother, not my father, but it's me, oh Lord. I'm standing in the need of prayer. It's not my mother, not my father, but it's me, oh Lord. I'm standing in the need of prayer. It's a me, it's a me, it's a me, oh Lord. I'm standing in the need of prayer. It's a me, it's a me, it's a me, oh Lord. I'm standing in the need of prayer. It's a me, it's a me, it's a me, oh Lord. I'm standing in the need of prayer. 
It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. I'm standing in the need of prayer. Oh yes, I'm standing in the need of prayer. I'm standing in the need of prayer. I'm standing in the need of prayer. Make sure before you leave the room that you get hugs from at least three people.